Committee on the Committee on Social Services, Veterans, Culture, and Recreation. And members present is Alyssa Klein from Ward 7 to my left, and Janet Louise Guerra from Ward 4, and City Councilor Marianne Large from Ward 6. Um, I'd like to announce the audio video recording of this meeting, and also, again, we have um, North Street Association, Adam Cohen, who has asked Luke McGrath to do a recording of this meeting. I'd like to do an approval of the minutes of June 16, 2014. Good. Second. All in favor? Aye. Welcome, Meredith. Thank you. And Meredith is the IRS Director of Public Health of the City of Northampton. And Meredith is going to be speaking on the following, the scope of services provided by the Health Department, which then leads into the topic of emerging, emerging contagious disease. And she'll be doing a presentation on the screen. So Meredith, thank you again for being here. Sure, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me to come. It's a great opportunity because we have two new city councilors here, um, one whom I've met and I haven't introduced myself to you formally. Gina Louise, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you also. So if you just take a few minutes prior to me speaking and just go over some of these slides, it just kind of gives you an overview of some of the stuff that we see and do in the health department. I think pictures can, yeah, if we can maybe lower the lights a little bit, speak volume. Oh, in the back there. Yes. <laughs> we give out about a thousand flu vaccines every year in the city. Just be about one more minute and we'll be through. And then I'll start talking.
this is just a snapshot of some of the services that we provide and some of the things that we see upon inspection. That's okay. Instead of fooling you with it, I'll just, I don't mind moving the slides anyways. <laughs> so, um, again, that was just a snapshot of some of the things that we do. I think that pictures speak volumes, um, you know, seeing firsthand what infections can look like and what have you. Infections, inspections, what it is that we do. So, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what it is that the Board of Health and Health Department are. Um, some of the functions that we provide, services that we provide in the city, um, some that are mandated, some on working with other groups of interest here in the city on working on health initiatives, and things that we're looking to in the future. So, anyways, the slide that we have up here shows the makeup of the Board of Health and the Health Department. In 1859, the Sanitation Commission called for the establishment of local bo uh, boards of health, which are separate from city government. There are 351 local boards of health here in Massachusetts, and each local board of health in Massachusetts has their home rule. Most all other states either have district, county, or state health departments. We are very, very unique here in, this, in the state of Massachusetts. Board of Health are the regulating authority whose primary focus is to set policy, make regulation that protect, protect preserve, and improve the health of the community. Here in the city, we have a five-member Board of Health. That was just recently changed to five members because of the charter change. Our five members have a very diverse back background and make and um, bring a lot to the table. We have a retired um, CDC physician. We have a physician who is the director of, of infectious control of, over at Cooley Dickinson Hospital. We have an OSHA, a retired OSHA compliance officer. We have um, a professor from UMass, and then we have someone who works for the State Department of Public Health. So they have diverse backgrounds, they're very educated, and they honestly bring a lot to the table every single meeting and every day that we work together. Um, the public health director, myself, my role is to, um, is to keep the Board of Health aware and apprised of what's going on in the community, do community health assessments and provide that information to the Board of Health so then they can set policy and make regulation. I also am responsible to the mayor. That too was a change due to the charter. Primary, uh, before that it was just I, uh, my, I was responsible to the Board of Health. The health department is comprised of myself, the health director, and again my roles are to um, update both the board and the mayor what's going on in terms of community health and then I have a staff of four. I have um, a full-time inspector, I have a part-time inspector, I have a part-time clerk, and a full-time public health nurse. Okay. Here is a list of um, our primary services that we provide in the health department. So we have two, oh dear. So <clears throat> we have an inspectional component of the department and then we have a component that works on health and wellness initiatives. The inspectional component is mandated by the State Department of Public Health. We have two primary roles. One to enforce the um, state sanitary codes and DEP Title V codes, and then the other one is to assess and be responsive in the terms of communicable disease. So those are two roles. These are mandated by the State Department of Public Health. So that leads us to our inspectional services. We do food service full food service establishments. We do retail food service establishments. 
our food service establishment, there is a whole, is an umbrella that covers mobile food services, temporary events, farmers markets, um, bed and breakfast, frozen desserts, retail, restaurants, catering. So that's what that all covers. We permit 452 establishments a year under food service. And we did, last, this is calendar year. In calendar year 2013, we did 823 inspections just under that umbrella. We inspect recreational water. So we do all the indoor and outdoor pools, seasonal pools. We do the beaches, hot tubs, and we do um, water quality and testing in the Mill River. We don't do the test testing, but we provide the services if there's any kind of elevated results in the Mill River and um, out by the boat dock. We do housing and nuisance complaints. This calendar year, we did 239 inspections. These do not encompass any reinspections that we had to do to follow up. We do Title V. Title V means anything around septic. So we witness percolation tests. We um, do final inspections for septic installation. We review plans. We look at wells, review plans. We inspect the schools. We inspect recreational camps. We do tobacco compliance inspection. Hotel motels, tanning, body art, practitioners and establishments. We do all the radius control and the barn inspections. So, yep. Question a housing slash nuisance. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? So, okay, housing inspections are when you have a resident that call up to um, tell us about any complaints that they might have with their rental property. Oh, okay. So we have to go out and do that. Nuisance is everything outside of that. It would be an overflowing dumpster, overgrown vegetation, odors, etc. Like when I made calls mm -hmm. to just recently yep. about two sites. Yep those would fall under the nuisance category. And we break those down. There's a um, hole in this underneath that also. Okay. So in calendar year 2013, we issued 658 permits and we did 1,416 inspections. Now, let me remind you, I have a staff of one and a half inspectors that did all of that. So it's very, very cumbersome. Our revenue for 2013 just in generating permits was about $85,000. That doesn't include any type of grant work that we did. This is our payroll and operating budget, seven-year comparison thereof. So you can see um, the majority of my budget goes to, and I don't know why, um, the majority of my budget goes to um, PNS salary, and there's a very minimal amount that goes to the actual operating budget. So I have to be very crafty and clever about finding money elsewhere to help provide these services or do anything above and beyond our, uh, our limitations that are set because of our financial situation in the health department. So, and why is your OM um, projected to be higher in 2015? We were told to be level funded this year. Um, it will increase because of um, a contract that we've worked out with Amherst our part-time inspector is a shared inspector with Amherst, and they'll be pulling him out of my O&M and taking out of my my payroll. So it'll be pretty much the same. It'll just a little. It'll look differently graphically because of where we're pulling money. But yes, we were actually level funded this year. So with that being said, I had mentioned, I don't know why, <laughs> I apologize. I'm not familiar with why I was doing this, but um, with that being said, so that, it, that covers the inspectional services we provide out of our department. Then I said on the other um, things that we provide, we work on um, behavior related disease, working on health and wellness initiatives. Um, people die differently now than they did 100 years ago. A lot has to do with um, sanitation, canning, pasteurization, infectious disease, et cetera. What kills people now are typically behavior related. Smoking tobacco, overeating, lack of exercise, heart disease, et cetera. So that's what we work when we work on when we have free time. And here's a great slide. Maybe. Yeah, 
forward it with that? That's fabulous. I pressed the freeze button and it seemed to actually freeze it and then I pressed it again. It seemed to have I'm frozen it. <laughs> Sorry, Pam set this up for me, so I didn't want to mess with anything. So with that being said, um, we, we, uh, let's where you're talking about, excuse me, the way people died. So this is a great graph that depicts the way that people died and what happened throughout the course of the years. So infectious disease have plagued humans throughout history. In fact, there's, there, um, they've even shaped history on some occasions. The plagues, we've had the plagues of the biblical times, Black Death of the Middle Ages, Spanish Flu pandemic of 1918, which killed a half million people here in the U.S. and up to 50 million people worldwide. Um, so, I mean, they've really, really shaped our history. And you can see also in there that we had the advent of penicillin and our, we have um, uh, people dying less of infectious disease due to that. And then we kind of taper off in the 70s and the 80s and now as we hit 2000 on this graph, we're starting to rise again. Um, I wish that they'd continue this graph into 2014 right now because you'd see it, um, it's starting to spike up, that we're now dying because of infectious disease again. We have emerging infect infectious disease and re-emerging infectious disease. So on top of um, providing inspectional services and managing the department, I now have to think about emerging and re-emerging infections. Oh, my goodness. Can I go back and then hit freeze and see what There we go. Um, emerging diseases are newly identified and previously unknown infectious agents that cause public health problems. They can be either locally, internationally, or nationally. Some of the things that we're concerned about are um, arboviruses, which are Eastern equine encephalitis, also known as triple E, West Nile virus, um, MERS, SARS, <coughs> avian flu. These are some of the emergence. Re-emerging infectious disease are those that have been known for some time, but fa have fallen to such a low level that they were no longer of concern to the public. And now they're showing incidents again and possibly trends again. So these are re-emerging infectious disease. So I don't know if you're going to cover this one a bit, but um, if so, if you, you can answer it then, but um, I'm curious what you're doing for those, I mean those re-emerging infectious diseases that we haven't seen for a long time, those are also sort of behavioral, mm -hmm. you can then fall into the behavioral yep. category. Yep, exactly. And the choice that's sort of leading to that. So I'm curious what you're doing to sure. absolutely. come mm -hmm. up with that or mm -hmm. do public education about it. Sure, absolutely. Uh, let's talk about that for a second. Let me just take a step back. So some of the diseases that are of concern right now that are on my forefront our influenza, we have our typical influenza, then we have our atypical influenza. Measles, mumps, pertussis, hep C, norovirus, triple E, West Nile virus, dengue, and Lyme. Those are our tick-borne diseases. These are the things that are right here that are relevant. These are the things that I'm watching and assessing and monitoring every single day. I monitor here in Northampton. The first thing I do when I get to work in the morning is I go on to the State Department surveillance system and I read to see if there's anything. They have to report to us in the health department in Northampton if there's anything in my community, if anyone's been diagnosed, a resident's been diagnosed with any communicable disease. That's the first thing I do. Then I look at the county health, and then I look at the, the nation's health, and I'm even watching international health. I go to the WHO because there are so many things that are so relevant to what could be happening here down the road. I, I watch Ebola. I'm terrified of Ebola. Um, to tell you, I, to be honest with you, we now have we have a dengue case here in the city of Northampton, who is a doctor um, without borders and goes over and helps. And he was in Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, and one of his friends, who's also a doctor without borders, who was helping the Ebola cases, is now here in the city of Northampton visiting. So I mean, these are things that we need to be cognizant about and to be educated on 
and to keep our eyes on and monitor and prevail at all times. So this is what I do. I do our local, our county, our state on a daily basis, and then I do our national weekly, uh, our national and international on a um, weekly basis. How did you learn that he was here in the town? I mean, how, how do you find out that kind of So dengue uh, is a reportable disease. So if someone is diagnosed with it who lives in the city of Northampton, it's mandated by the physician that they report to the State Department of Public Health, who then reports to the local Board of Health Department. So then how did you know that his friend? Upon interviewing, because uh, those are some of the questions that we ask. Where did they, you know, where did they travel from? Do they have, there's a, a whole um, Q&A that we have to go through depending on the type of disease. The type of disease, what's the symptoms of Of dengue? I had dengue myself. <laughs> it's kind of like malaria. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's from a mosquito, and actually dengue, mosquitoes that uh, carry dengue fever have actually made parts of the U.S. their home now. They proliferate here. They breed here, where 10 years ago they weren't. But we're also seeing that with eastern equine encephalitis. They were saying prior to two years ago that this was an eastern mass problem, not a western mass mm -hmm. problem. And because of a project that I did here in the city of Northampton last year, we realized, or the State Department of Public Health now realizes that these mosquitoes that carry triple E breed here and make Western Mass their home. They don't mind their borders anymore. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's because of environmental change and, yeah, climate what change. Like hepatitis B. Pardon me? How do you get that? Oops. On hepatitis C. Hepatitis, okay. Two of them How do you get C? Hepatitis, that is fecal to mouth. By the mouth? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Ingestion. Accident. So most, most are bloodborne. Um, one is oral, fecal to oral. Yep. And actually, excuse me, I have that back. A is fecal to oral, C is blood. So he is, C would be through sharing needles, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So right here is a great map of um, recent emerging diseases. And it just kind of gives you a quick overview of what's going on worldwide. Hmm? Oh gosh, this is going to be the death of me here. So I think it's a nice picture. Uh, let's see. So factors that contribute to emerging diseases, obviously, are the evolution of pathogenic infectious agents, development to um, resistance to drugs, resistance to vectors, international travel, human behavior, etc. So vaccines come under that topic, human behavior. Vaccines is one of the most cost effective and one of the most successful public health interventions that have ever been besides sanitiz sanitation. Um, cost effective saves an estimate six to nine million lives worldwide. In the United States, it has decreased vaccine preventable diseases in children up to 95%. We rely on vaccines to protect ourselves. The majority of people getting the proper vaccines to protect ourselves. It's called herd immunity. Vaccines don't only just protect you, but they protect the people in your community. If the proportion of the people within your community are vaccinated, it gives this kind of umbrella to those who cannot receive vaccination. And that might be because they're not of age yet or they're, um, they have medical conditions where they can't receive vaccines. So we want to ensure that our vaccine rates stay high so we can protect those, again, who don't have it. Um, unfortunately, there, have been, there has been this anti-vaccination movement. Um, there have been strategic vaccine campaigns that have virtually, virtually eliminated um, all the work that we have done through vaccine promotion. 
and there are reasons behind that. We have um, the anti-vaxxers. These, there was a physician back in the seven, uh, excuse me, in the 80s who made these publishings correlating vaccines to autism. Okay, he not only published these in medical journals, he also got um, very, very high. Um, um, what do we want to call them? Representatives from television. Um, uh, celebrities. Celebrities, thank you, to speak about the link between vaccines and autism. These pe people, general population, listen to ce celebrities. They're, they're saying, you know, they're hearing what they say is the gospel. So this led to a huge rise of unvaccinated or undervaccinated children, which is very problematic. Here in Northampton, our under or unvaccinated rate of school-aged children is, is 4.6 percent. That is over 2 percent of the national average. So that is very, very high. We also have those who don't get vaccines because they are anti-government. They think, you know, this is another government mandated, take my money, tell you what to do kind of thing. So there are a bunch of reasons why people aren't getting vaccine, vaccines, but all I do know is it's here, it's prevalent, and it's problematic. And we have to have a huge education campaign to kind of reverse this trend. Because as you can see, or might have heard in the news, um, probably three or four months ago, we had measles right here in Northampton. This one case, this one, uh, this one woman, um, led us to vaccinate to, to giving vaccines to 47 people here in the city um, and we also had to quarantine a high school student a senior high school student for 21 days in her home okay that's what it leads to what kind of public education campaign are you able to do uh, I mean the size the limit when it comes to education that's what we're all about. We're not, I mean, yes, we're here and we have to do enforcement and compliance, but we're all about education. Even when we're doing our food service inspections, if they're not in compliance with the law, we educate them on why they need to be and what it does if you don't. Um, so again, the size limit with vaccine education. I'm working with the school department right now to target those who are turning 18 and going off to college because at the age of 18, they can make up their own decisions on whether or not they want to receive vaccine or not. Um, and again, it's kind of reversing all this damage that was done by this, um, this physician and, you know, the celebrity saying that there is a link with vaccine to autism. All of those medical journals, um, papers that were published have been retracted. They're not valid. The unfortunate thing is when you do a Google search and you Google vaccine and autism, it brings you to those, not that they're not valid or have been taken off the table in the, in the medical field. Is there any legal recourse? In other words, can, can schools, public schools, or camps keep children from attending if they don't have vaccination records? Is that a way that some places are handling that? No, there's not. Camps, if they're privately run, they can. But schools, do you have exemptions. You can either be exempt for religious, religi religious reasons or because of medical reasons. Religious exemptions don't require any paperwork. They just need a signature from mom and dad or guardian saying, yep, my child is exempt from receiving vaccines because of religious reasons. They don't have to prove anything. And people use it all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess my other question is, do you feel like you have the resources to be able to, to get, to combat the misinformation um, or this is the leading question. Do you feel like you have, you know, you have the budget or the, the resources to be able to do the kind of public education that you'd like to? Oh, absolutely not. No, no. I, I'm going to rely on my community partners to help me with this, but it, this isn't just unique to Northampton. I mean, this is a nationwide problem. Um, so I'm hoping that it, you know, it comes from the feds down to help you know, with this, this educational campaign when it comes to vaccines, that's what I'm really hoping. But until that happens, um, I do have, you know, a lot of partners in the school department. Um, I'm working with um, the, executive director, the executive director of the housing authority um, because he, he houses a lot of the lower income children um, on some of his properties and those are the targeted children that we want to hit and make sure that they have vaccines. We're going to do mobile clinics, mo mobile health education clinics, um, 
No, we don't. We don't have the resources to do it, but I'm pretty crafty when it comes to, you know, when it comes to thinking outside of the box and making, you know, a dime go into a dollar kind of thing. So we'll just get it done. Mm -hmm. We can do what we can do and rely on our partners. So with that being said, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of work that needs to be done around vaccines. Otherwise, we're going to have issues here in the city of Northampton. Um, we, in, in pertussis is another one of the vaccine preventable diseases that we've had to deal with here in Northampton. There's been an uptick in pertussis cases. In 2004, um, you know, we, we've seen nationwide a huge uptick in pertussis. In 2010, there was 455 infants and 10 deaths in California that happened from pertussis. 2012, there were more cases in pertussis in this one year than there was since 1955 to that date in its entirety. And then in 2013, we had an outbreak here in Northampton. We had 47 high school children come down with pertussis. And those are the primary cases of high schoolers. You also have secondary and tertiary cases that could have been family members and or relatives or visitors of the index case. So there was a huge, huge outbreak. Um, other diseases that we're watching are mumps, um, arbovirus, norovirus, et cetera. There's a lot going on and a lot that occupies our time when it comes to emerging and re-emerging disease. Meredith, mm -hmm. do you think an autism epidemic, I don't, what would that have to do with us? Pardon me? You're talking about autism epidemic. Where, what they, they just call it the autism epidemic, that the link of the vaccine leads to autism. Okay. But it doesn't. It doesn't, right. That's what, yeah, that was just the word that they used in the field. So the role of public health, which you can't see. Our role when it comes to um, infectious disease, again, surveillance and early response. Again, we go on the Massachusetts surveillance system every single day, myself and my public health nurse to see what's going on. Do an assessment in the health status in the community. Look at risk services that are available. You want to develop health policy. We do laboratory identification. We do rapid communication with um, medical uh, physicians and the hospitals. We, um, you know, we talk to the media, we want to let them know what's going on, but without putting any type of mass hysteria in the community. And then again, it's all about environmental assessment and remediation. That's what we do around emerging uh, infectious disease and re-emerging infectious disease. So in a nutshell, I mean, what does public health do? Well, it's forever evolving, um, you know, it changes because we see um, new factors in the environment. Um, acts of bioterrorism, um, climate, you know, global warming, climate change. There are lots of reasons um, behind the ever evolving public health department, their scopes of services. But what it comes down to is we like to provide our community. I'll press freeze. Um, these 10 essential services, which is very important, and that. You're continually, continually to assess your community, monitor the health, be able to diagnose and investigate. You want to inform, educate, empower your community, mobilize partnerships, develop policies, and then give assurance to your community members. This is what we strive to every single day. What does public health do? It's the art and science of protecting and inspiring the health of the community through education, promotion of healthy lifestyles, and research for disease and injury prevention. So that sentence in a nutshell it kind of encompasses my day. We do have um, a very, very small department. Um, it's not to say it's not an effective department. We definitely work with what we have. Um, I'm always trying to advocate to city councilors and to the mayor that we need to grow our department to be able to, to better provide the services that we could provide um, to our community, but what we do, you know, we do meet our mandates and we do have opportunities to partner with other groups in the city to work on health and wellness initiatives.
And that's it. Meredith, when you were in Pittsfield, mm -hmm. which you had more staff, mm -hmm. right? yes. Was it easier getting money there than it is here? Yes, I had a million dollar budget in Pittsfield. I had my own water department, my own water lab in Pittsfield. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a staff of 16. Um, you know, uh, the environment is definitely different. It's definitely an urban uh, urban city with urban problems. You know, we, de we had a lot of blight. We had a lot of um, gang, high pregnancy rates, etc. cetera. Um, but the population is only about 10,000 more than it is here mm -hmm. in the city of Northampton. And we have more restaurants and inspectional services here in Northampton than we did in Pittsfield. Mm -hmm. And prior to Pittsfield, I spent eight years at the Hoyle Health Department. Mm -hmm. Are you, um, I mean, it's staggering. I'm really happy that you're here, and I'm really happy to hear all of this because it's absolutely staggering to me to see the number of inspections and permits that are going out, just the range of things that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. It's really remarkable what you're accomplishing with the staff that you have. Thank you. Um, are you seeing um, a lot of overtime? I mean, how is, the, how is that number of inspections happening? Right, so we don't have overtime in our budget whatsoever. Um, the uh, city does allow us to do comp time. They're allowed to have a max of 40 hours of comp time for an entire year. And um, I do give my departmental staff, my inspectors, flex time, um, which is to be used within a week. And it's only like a half an hour here if they have to stay at an event and make it up during that week. So no, it's, it is very difficult. I do inspections also, um, you know, as much as I can to help out. But then if there's any type of real issue, with something I take that on and I do the core aspect of it. We just manage, everyone has their niche, they're kind of comfortable in that, um, which is good because it helps maintain the level of services that we do provide. What's difficult is kind of integrating in the department and, and getting everyone trained to do everyone else's job. That, that's difficult because honestly we don't have any extra minutes um, in the day, so. And is there any gray area with other um, I mean, since I saw that you had one picture of somebody inspecting the outside of the house or something like mm -hmm. that, are there things that you can kind of share with other departments in the city? Are there things that come to you and you realize actually that should be for the building inspector, mm -hmm. not for us? And, mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. and we do team inspections there? with the building department, they have plumbing, gas, electrical, and the fire department. So there's a code enforcement team. And we do do tandem inspections together if we think but that there's going to be. But is it always clear kind of which department things fall under? Is, is some of it kind of It's clear? sort of clear. Um, and if there's a question about the unknown, it always comes back to our department because we have more teeth and leverage than anyone. We can condemn under um, Chapter 111, Section 22, where the other departments don't have that. The fire department has a section where it can condemn, but it's much easier for us to do things like that. So we're kind of like the fail-safe for all the other departments and codes. And are most of those referrals, most of those uh, call-outs for uh, not the routine inspections, but kind of issues and nuisance, are they coming from citizens or from the police department? What, what's the reason? Primarily, the we're complaint-driven, and they are coming from citizens. Um, but we do get notice of hazards from police, fire, and building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So a picture of, I'm oh, sorry, that's all okay. Of um, inspecting a pool or, or a hot tub, is that like at, at a citizen's house? No, no, no. Is we don't do residential, we only okay. do commercial. So when there's any type of public or semi public use, okay. that's when we go in and we do them. But mm -hmm. you inspect, like Lisa was saying, you inspect the outside of homes. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or, and what do you look we don't look for structural integrity, but my inspectors, I mean, they are. They, they, they come with experience in fire and building and con general contractors, so they do have the wherewithal to go out and know if something is structurally compromised or not, so we can then refer it on. But there are inspections that we have to do outside, say for any type of rodent infestation. So if someone is complaining about rats, we can look for rat runs around the basement. Rats leave like this greasy trail. They, they go around the perimeter and they leave this greasy trail. So, you know. <laughs> That's something that we look for when we're going outside of the house, if that was one of the complaints that drove us to go there. Mm -hmm. that, that's just like, as an example on my board, yeah. I'm Kellyanne Cheris, Meredith worked very closely with us in the police department. This house was terrible. 
terrible. I cannot believe the difference of that house. Yeah, great, huh? It's unbelievable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I get complaints all the time. Gee, my boys, even with grass being a certain height, with nobody living at home mm -hmm. at all, and just abandoning the property, which she's working on right now with a resident of mine on West Barnes Road, and it's become a sore eye, and people are very concerned about the appearance of this home, their property. Is it are they going to be like valued? Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I get complaints constantly. She's worked very closely, and the building inspector on my ward. We've been busy for the past. Well, two years on one, and we're going to court, and we're going back to court again July 28th for two cases. Mm -hmm. It doesn't stop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, another question. Sure. Yeah. It's interesting to me. I come actually from a public health background, and I worked for a long time in interpersonal violence prevention. And looking at all the kind of lists and things, I was kind of intrigued to see that violence prevention didn't come up as one of the mm -hmm. list of things. And I'm wondering if that's something that just is kind of, you see is beyond your purview, or if you just don't have time and money, or, but so you know, why I like to think of myself as this full service department, and you know, we try to get referrals and lead people to the right place that they need to be. So, you know, we do see, and I do, we do have cases that come in and talk about that, and we always refer them on where they need to go. However, the State Department of Public Health oversees that. That falls under their um, scope of services. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. But I do have relations with all the shelters and so. You're doing a wonderful job. Your department, your staff, it's not an easy job. And I have to say, since Mary was come, I mean, there's been some big changes mm -hmm. in your department. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. It's, it's great having the support of, you know, the city councilors when you need it, when you're going, asking the mayor for money. You know, when I started here, we had a 19-hour-a-week um, public health nurse. 19 hours a week, we couldn't even meet our mandates with that. So on top of being my role and helping with inspectional services, I was also being the public health nurse, which was very, very dif difficult and cumbersome. So it's just kind of making people aware of what it is that we do do, like, Councilor Klein, you're sitting here today going, I cannot believe that, you know, you provide all these services out of your department. It's just kind of touting what it is that we do and what we need to get the job done, you know, efficiently and effectively and just hopefully, you know, rallying support when time comes, you know, when push comes to shove and we need it. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting too. I just, I didn't have a sense of kind of what was your purview versus the department of public health. Mm -hmm. so it's really good for me to understand that. As part of all the public education that you do, if you could just kind of clarify what right. mm -hmm. done by you versus the Department of Public Health, that could be um, mm -hmm. too, probably. Yep, yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. So, some of the great initiatives that we're working on now, you know, um, we are part of Mass in Motion, so we're working on food equity, we're working on promoting exercise. We no longer have free-range children, you know. Children ask to go out and play in the cul-de-sac, where when we were growing up, we left, you know, when the sun was out and we came back when it was when it was time for dinner. So those are things that we're working on. Um, this opiate epidemic that we have here, um, not just in the city or in, you know, the county, I mean, this is nationwide working on initiatives to combat that. I just wrote a grant, submitted a grant the other day for all um, us not being where we should be at for all of the unused needles that we're finding in the streets. You know, we have different departments going out there and collecting them who are not trained or vaccinated to do so if they get stuck by these needles. So, yeah, again, I cannot, it's, I've been in public health for 12 years and I never, ever thought I was going to see the day where I had to work a measles case. So it is forever, ever evolving and changing, and it's just kind of being one step ahead. You know, half the times I feel like I can't even tread water, but, you know, with that same breath, you have to be a little bit ahead of the game to help protect your community. Mm -hmm. I think one of the exciting things that you talked about is just the partnerships. Mm -hmm. I imagine, like, imagine that, you know, you're partnering with the Department of Public Health, mm -hmm. with all kinds of nonprofit organizations, yep. um, and that's how you can kind of leverage, mm -hmm. I guess, it's 
taken me a while to get there because I worked in Hamden County for eight years and then Berkshire County for two years and coming here and not knowing the players. You know, it's kind of been a, a, one of the most difficult things in my transition here was getting to know everyone, but that's all coming together now full circle and we're sitting at the table and brain dumping together and just, I mean, we've got great things in the works and it's very exciting for the community. As much as I'm excited about the partnership around the, the pesticide task force that we're looking at, I feel guilty now knowing how much you do adding another thing to your plate, so. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, that you know, that's good because I'm kind of on the periphery of that, and I just to you know I get to listen and I get to educate myself and then bring that information and educate the community. No, it's it's good. It's not like I'm spearheading. Y you are. You're taking the lead, which is fabulous. We need someone with interest to help do these things. Otherwise, I could be sitting in my office saying, "Yes, I hate pesticides, and it's something I want to do, but I could never get it off the ground without people like you." So. So impressed with everything that you do that's taking that on. So, mm -hmm. thank you. I mean, feel free to call me, come down to the office, take a tour. <laughs> Can I ask a question mm -hmm. on how the public smoking ban is going? So, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's going. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions about that, and, you know, I'm, I'm willing to let them go because they are actually helping us. People think, I can't not tell you how many people think that there is no more smoking allowed on the sidewalks of of the streets of Northampton, I've actually seen and have heard about, you know, some of our visitors going out there and not seeing as many smokers, handlers smoking on the sidewalk. So it's worked for our advantage. How is it going? We're really not going to know until next season, next summer. Um, what went into effect was some changes around business about the sale to minors. So we don't, we have the we card all policy. We've um, prohibited the sale of blunt wrappers. We put minimum pricing on cigars. All this stuff is that geared towards the children. Those are really the people that we're trying to protect because those are the people that they're marketing to trying to get hooked with their cotton candy cigarettes and gummy bear flavored wrappers. Um, that's working beautifully. I really have not had any complaints whatsoever from the business owners. We had, um, we, this was a topic of our Board of Health meeting for 14 months, um, you know, very few people came in to, to speak opposing it. Mm -hmm. What we were doing, we had a lot of advocates thereof. And then during the public hearing, we had probably a dozen business owners in the audience at our public hearing, and no one spoke out except um, uh, da -da -da -da, the club. I can't think of the, the name of the club um, that allowed smoking to veterans. Um, the the yes, thank you. Um, so there are no proponents then either. Um, everyone's in compliance. We did an educational compliance check about a month ago and spoke to all of the vendors. And again, they had no problem with what was going on. And some of some of them even thanked us. You know, they hated to. Oh, thank you very much. Where did you find that? Your daughter. <laughs> oh, she gave it to me. That is hysterical. Hoping you're trying to find you. <laughs> um, you know, the, the state law said you had to card anyone that looked under the age of 27. Again, age is very, um, I mean, you can see someone who, who, who you might think looks 18, and I might think that looks 27. So there's a lot of variables to that, and that just eliminates that from the equation. So it's been, it's been good overall. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Thank you.
it is booked. Yeah, it's booked. Okay, okay. Pam, she checked it out for you. It's all set. And I also want to tell you, no matter what I book, don't worry about it, because I always can change that. That's okay. no big deal. That's great. Okay. Thank you. The only problem I have. We're all set with that. Both of us don't have to worry about booking from 5 to 6.30 in here. We're all set. October 20th, I have Joanne Campbell coming in, Director of Valley Community Development, and Peggy really wanted them in here. Okay. I don't know if you know Joanne Campbell. I think you do, don't you? They're fantastic. Um, and then I had Vibrant Sidewalk Resolution for October 20th, but we don't need that because I think you'll have it pretty well booked to the one we're going to have the next meeting in October. So I don't have to, well, we don't have to bring that up.
until 8.30, 30? Yeah. 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 So the 14th is the day after Columbus Day. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'll do anything you want. I'll post it or I'll wherever. Okay, um, we feel that the, the Florence Business Association doesn't own the sidewalks. They don't have control over what we want to do. And I know for myself, being disabled, if I come out of the bank, I can't walk to either end of Florence to get to a bench. I mean, I try and sit on their raised wall. Sidewalks are necessary. And they don't have the right to say yes, no, or maybe. We did it as a courtesy going to them. And they flat out said, no, we don't need them. Well, maybe they don't need them, but I'm willing to bet half of the citizens in Florence that go downtown would be more than willing to use them. I've made a, a habit of driving, driving around downtown to check, and the last four times that my husband and I drove to check the benches, on two occasions they were completely full. There wasn't a seat to be had. On one occasion, only one side was full, the side that has the little fountain on it toward the, which end is that? Where you go around the roadway by the library? And on one occasion, there were only like two people sitting on the benches, but two of the times they were completely full. And we just don't feel that they have the right to tell us flat out no. Do they have the authority to make the decision? So what's, then what's the issue? The issue is, they, is that we were informed by Jim Lurillo because he attended the meeting and so forth. He's done the right. too. And apparently they felt because there's benches in the park that it's not necessary to have them on the sidewalk and that they had not gotten any calls on having benches. Well, naturally, people probably didn't know but the Florence Civic Association that they had to go to, but the Commission on Disabilities, we have had people approach us and we do have some who have difficulty walking. And um, so we've also asked for the mayor's support on this issue. So I think it's good that the Florence Business Association be involved in vibrant sidewalks because I think the language is so important in it because sidewalks are to be used for everybody. So we're trying to get clarification from the Florence Business Association of the really purpose of this, even though they're saying a new mobile deal station is being put up, that the owners are going to go ahead and put two benches I that on their private. Oh yeah, they got plans on redoing it over and everything. But even so, it's private property. 
okay, and they're going to place two benches. The Commission on Disabilities has offered to donate two benches in the, in the town of Florence. So, so what's stopping you from going forward with the place? Because we, what we did was, was the right thing. We went through the appropriate channels, okay, which was going through Jim Marillo and the Board of Public Works right. doing site visits, which Alyssa was involved with us. And we picked out areas that we thought would be great. Jim went to, um, I think it was um, Mike Flynn, and is that Bob Ross? I think Bob Ross. And told them, and they wanted to see some plans. So Jim went to the board meeting, and they felt just exactly what I said, that they do have parks, okay, with benches, and felt that they did not get calls on it. Right. I mean, okay. I, I and now we are explaining to them the, the purposes of the benches. So and you're continuing letter. with this courtesy even though they don't have the authority that Exactly. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. We're trying to be as professional as can be with this. And Alyssa, I introduced her to the owner of the Florence Diner, and they're happy about it. They'd like to have one place on the sidewalk, and there's a Florence Diner, you know. And it's very difficult to explain because some of our um, members on our commission, one of them I think has MS, mm -hmm. and really has a problem walking. Even on Main Street, you'll see. Well, you don't have to sell the benches to me. I think they're a great idea. And they <laughs> are. Just go ahead and put them in. And she's up in Florence, and she says that she has difficulty walking and can't sit. You know, so gonna, we're, we're trying to be as respectful as can be. Going through the channels, but we do have an attorney who is writing a letter to the association. down here. I'm leaving. Good evening. Um, I'm Bernice Drumheller, president of NAMI Western Mass. Uh, thank you, City Councilor uh, Labarge and Councilor Klein, and members of the City Council, for this opportunity to speak about the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Mental illness affects everyone. Nearly 60 million Americans experience mental health conditions every year, regardless of race, age, religion, or economic status. Mental illness impacts the lives of at least one in four adults and one in ten children across the United States. People living with mental illness need help and hope. They need a community that supports them, their families, and their recovery. Because mental illness devastates the lives of so many Americans, NAMI works every day to save every life. NAMI is the voice of mental illness. It is important to become a member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness 
the largest grassroots mental health organization since 1982 in Massachusetts. We need you to be the voice for those who cannot speak for themselves. The larger our membership, the louder we are heard by the public. Policy, community, legislation, statewide and nationally. NAMI is dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. NAMI advocates for access to services, treatment, supports, and research, and is steadfast in its commitment to raise awareness and build a community for hope for all those in need. Every day we reach out and respond to those in need. NAMI is the foundation for hundreds of NAMI state organizations, NAMI affiliates, and volunteer leaders who work in local communities across the country to raise awareness and provide essential and free education, advocacy, and support group programs. Since 1979, NAMI has established itself as the most formidable grassroots mental health advocacy organization in the country. And NAMI's mission has produced profound changes. <coughs> NAMI has been the driving force behind a national investment in life-saving research, parity for mental health care, increased housing, and to ensure that treatments and services are available to those in need when they need it the most. NAMI awareness efforts have successfully addressed the stigma of mental illness, enduring the decrease of barriers to treatment and recovery. NAMI's signature education programs have served as a beacon of hope for hundreds of thousands of families and individuals. NAMI offers the understanding that only those with a lived experience of mental illness can provide. Together with our grassroots volunteers, we work every day to provide help and hope to millions of Americans. NAMI Western Mass, a nonprofit organization and the largest affiliate in Massachusetts, serving Hamden, Hampshire, and Franklin counties operates on donations alone and offers no, no cost support groups to individuals and families, education and training programs, and peer advocacy. Our office is located in Agwan and is open Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 3. Our largest fundraisers are the Walkathon in May and our annual Iris Project in September and October. That was originally started to bring visibility and educate the public about mental illness. Our mission is dedicated to helping to improve the quality of life for individuals and families affected by mental illness through support, education, and advocacy. This year, on October 4th, we will be celebrating over 30 years of service to our community. Join. NAMI Western Mass and keynote speaker, former Massachusetts First Lady Kitty, Kitty Dukakis for an evening of hope and recovery. This is a one-time benefit at Chase Joseph and Aglam celebrating over 30 years of services to the Pioneer Valley mental health community. Please come and join us in this celebration. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Councillor Klein. Uh, good evening. Uh, we really welcome this opportunity. And we, first, let me also thank Council Labarge uh, for the work you do on this committee. You are doing very important work. I would also like to note that we greatly appreciate the support of our mayor, Mayor Narkoway, to help create awareness of mental illness by issuing a proclamation declaring Mental Health Awareness Month and Week. A couple of years ago, I would not be able to stand before you and talk about the subject of mental illness. I, was not, I, was, I did not feel confident that I could ever hold a candle to Denise Drummond 
nor will I ever be able to. I started attending a support group for families of loved ones living with mental illness at Cooley Dickinson Hospital, led by Bruce Bradley Gilbert. Bruce, who is the lead counselor at Cooley Dick and an intern, encouraged me to take the Family to Family course that is provided by the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I was also encouraged to take the teacher's training. When I first called Bernice, I knew I found someone who understood as the National Alliance on Mental Illness teaches that when you are with NAMI, you are not alone. They speak, they speak the language of family and those living with mental illness. I could not wait for the Family to Family course to begin, and I was not disappointed. The National Alliance on Mental Illness teaches where there is help, there is hope. They also teach knowledge is power. Dr. Joyce Berlin, PhD, is a member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness Board of Directors. She authored the Family to Family Chorus. Her daughter and sister were living with schizophrenia. Dr. Berlin talks about this is the only illness no one brings your family a casserole when someone's sick. I would like to note that the evidence notes that the Family to Family Chorus was entered into the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration in 2013. Over 300,000 300, families and individuals have completed this course nationwide, and that number continues to climb. NAMI's Family to Family Education Program significantly approves the coping and problem-solving abilities for family members of individuals living with mental illness. This is according to a landmark study published in Psychiatric Services, a journal of the American Psychiatric Association. Now let's get to down to talking what the Family to Family course is. It's a 12-week free course for family caregivers of individuals with severe mental illness that discusses the clinical treatment of these illnesses and teaches the knowledge and skills that family members need to cope more effectively. The content of the curriculum includes the following. Principles, goals, learning about feelings, teaching how to recognize and understand schizophrenia, major depression, mania, and other critical periods. Oftentimes, families don't know what to look for, and they don't understand what they're dealing with, maybe a mental illness. Basics about the brain genetics, individual stages of recovery, biology of recovery, problem-solving workshops. We also discuss medications. We also make it quite clear that we're not physicians or doctors, but it's important for families to understand what medications are involved. We do, while we don't push medication, we also do not discourage families from taking from their loved one taking medication. It's important to realize that each situation is different. Empathy Workshop talks about strategies to protect the self-esteem of your loved one who is living with mental illness. It's important not to demean those that are living with, it, with this illness. It's a myth to say, oh, just pull yourself up by the bootstraps, son, and you'll be able to get through this. Mental illness is an illness, just like diabetes, heart disease, cancer, it's an illness, and it is treatable. We also do a communication workshop where we talk about how to talk with your loved one with mental illness. There may be timing is everything. Sometimes you can't talk about serious matters with your loved one, but it's important to know how to communicate effectively. We also talk about self-care and taking care of oneself. It's a very important for me to note here that families are acting as caregivers and case managers. While I recently attended a committee last few days ago, one of the mental health providers referred to families as the boots on the ground. That's what we are. We also talk about rehabilitation and recovery, fighting stigma, and how to advocate. We provide a resource library at each session with books and resources where families can find help. They often do not even know where to access health care services. It is my sincere feeling that unless family is considered as an integral aspect in helping your loved one access services and by providing for basic needs, that this will lead to more homelessness as families literally kick their loved ones out of the home because they often feel their behaviors are deliberate and intentional. The Gazette notes that the new housing for them, those living with mental illness are jails. This is not satisfactory. We can't accept this. I am proud to say that the Northampton Police Department have taken the crisis intervention training so that they can better understand and de-escalate situations when they respond where there's possible mental illness. 
Bernice Bremer, drum holler, takes part in those trainings to help train them. We have to admire our police force and our community for that. Every year, suicide claims 30,000 lives per NAMI. Over 90% of suicides are attributable to diagnosis of mental illness, this according to NAMI. During the course, we provide information about suicide prevention hotline so that families with those living with mental illness can know where to call. There's actually a 1-800 talk line where they can call 24 hours a day. We also talk about lo local crisis interventions. Families are shown how to develop a crisis file so that they know who to call and when to call. Because when a family's in crisis, things, emotions run high. It's important to know how to respond effectively. As I read the paper, I'm reading about those living with mental illness that are homeless, living on the sidewalks, sadly, or in jails, or about suicide. I realize the importance of education. I made a deal with NAMI. I said, I'll take your family to family teacher training on a condition that the NAMI of Western Mass would allow me to have partner with another teacher and Bernice Drumheller would support teaching in the Northampton area. We, the families, are the boots on the ground. We need to work with mental health professionals. And as a community, we need to walk, have walk-in mental health services available, navigators to help those living with mental illness to access services with their families and more supportive housing. I have to commend Northampton for what they're doing and how they're moving forward to, to try to provide more supportive housing. The free family-to-family -family course will be offered starting on September 6th on Saturdays from 9 to 11.30 for 12 consecutive weeks here at the Cooley Dickinson Hospital. Space is limited and pre-registration is required. We're very grateful to Cooley Dickinson for partnering with us for this course. Interested parties can call me, Ella, at 413-584-7796 or at e.smolinski at comcast.net or call the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Western Massachusetts at 1-413-786-9139. Please visit www.namiwm.org to learn more about the National Alliance on Mental Illness of Western Massachusetts. My sincere thanks to Council LaBarge and Councilor Klein for this opportunity to educate the public. I have requested that Northampton Community Tele Television air the Family to Family tribute video. I've also asked them to include information about the upcoming Family to Family course. We as a community need to work together. I'm proud to live in the community of Northampton. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, I just want to say before we um, conduct any discussion that people would like to have that there's another counselor here. Um, that's Gina Louise Shara, and she's from uh, Ward 4 in Northampton, and she's a member of this committee as well. Um, so. I just noticed that you both talked about me and <laughs> Councilor Barge. Sorry, unfortunately, <laughs> had to leave, but um, Councilor Shara is here too, and she's a very integral part of this committee. Well, nice to meet you. Very Sorry, we omitted you. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you for coming today. Do you have any questions for us? Well, I, I just want to say this is yeah. mental health issues affect have affected my family very deeply. We have a, a member of the family who suffers from a pretty serious mental illness. So, um, you know, and I've, I've said that to you before, Ella, it's, it's a really, it's an issue very close to my heart. I'm so glad that you're doing the work that you're doing. The course sounds amazing. I mean, just so incredibly well thought out in terms of everything that needs to be in a course to support a family. I mean, everything you talked about are things that my family has had to put into place over the years. Um, so I know firsthand, you know, that that it just sounds like you've done an amazing job putting that together. So thank you so much thank for, you. for the work that you do. And Bernice, you're not from Northampton, are you? Uh, no, I'm uh, Ashley from Hamden County. Okay. I live in Wilbraham. Well, thank you for making yes. the effort to come here yes, and to and, and speak with I've Ella. been coming to Northampton on a regular basis these days. And our NAMI Western Mass serves Hampshire County. So uh, this has been wonderful that we've been accepted into the fall here uh, quite well, well. I'm sure it has something to do with uh, I think the it power does. behind this <laughs> and, yes. and our community. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
and we appreciate that because we and, and we've had uh, a lot of feelings um, when the Northampton Hospital was closing. Uh, a lot of our board members were up here on a regular basis uh, during that time. So we've been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. I, I heard you talking about um, encouraging caregivers to do self-care, and which is just so incredibly important. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about how how what what kind of support can you give them, and how do you? It's well, so I. You know, in those moments, it's so hard to right, right. even take the time to think right. about yourself, even but though it's critical. Absolutely. How do you get yes. people to do that? The first thing we tell them is to take care of themselves uh, from a medical perspective. Mm -hmm. You have your physical, your mammogram. Uh, also talk to a doctor. And we also talk about it's okay for them to look for a therapist, someone they can talk to. We also encourage them, too, for good nutrition. Uh, actually, NAMI provides a website. It's called Heart and Mind. And on that Heart Mind part at our website at NAMI, N -A -M -I org, people can go on there and get health tips and information about keeping well. Uh, the other thing we encourage them to attend support groups mm -hmm. because the support group, the NAMI uh, course itself is, is, is as you said, uh, well, it's, uh, the content is there, but it's also important to be in that support group where you're not feeling alone with other people and can share experiences. We encourage, even at our uh, family to family course, we uh, talk about nutrition and we reflect that in our snacks. Bernice tells us, you know, about eating fruit and vegetables and getting out and walking, and we share uh, various ways we, uh, and members in the class, we ask them, what do you do uh, to help alleviate stress? But we uh, stress the importance of wellness for them because if they can't take care, are able to care for themselves, uh, they will find it very difficult coping with their situation as a family. One of the things that um, I've been thinking a lot about just because it's a very current issue for my family is the, some of the financial aspects, the financial burdens of um, caring for and arranging for the future of this person with mental illness in the family. And I'm wondering if that, I, I don't know if I heard you mention that as part of the course, but I'm wondering if NAMI has um, some kind of resources to help people think about that kind of issue. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, just one thing. Uh, we we strongly advise if you have um, to set up a special needs trust mm -hmm. for your family member. That's that's quite important. And um, but I mean, as far as uh, we do have two uh, disability lawyers on our board, uh, and they're all from this area. Uh, James Winston. Uh, he's in Northampton, and then we have Son Hee Chow, who is uh, in um, uh, Southampton or in this uh, Amherst area. So um, they could provide some information for you. If we don't have the answers, we have the people on our board. We have a 16-person board and most of them are from agencies and lawyers and so forth. So, um, you know, we can actually advise people to talk to these these people. And um, because NAMI Western Mass, we'd like to provide the services, but I mean, sometimes we don't have all the answers. <laughs> so we, we can give you people who can give you the answers. James uh, Winston is a great man. He comes into our class and he actually does a presentation. He talks about disability. He answers questions. We had a woman in our class last year who broke down into tears, a nurse, a retired nurse, who had spent her entire life saving a retirement fund trying to help her uh, son who's living with mental illness to support him. And so it is important we like to try to point people in the direction where a family can receive or that person can receive financial assistance because quite honestly, Council of Klein, it can wipe you out. And it is, uh, James Winston's been, uh, has a very kind manner and has coming into class where he's been very helpful as well. I guess one last question. Um, I'm kind of uh, interested in and intrigued by some of the alternatives to a more um, 
kind of mainstream approach to mental illness that we have locally. We have uh, Wind Horse, we have the Freedom Center as resources. And I'm wondering if NAMI has contact with them, if you work with kind of more radical or unusual, non-traditional organizations that yeah. work on mental health issues. Well, we, we do, uh, we do uh, advise people uh, <coughs> by their circumstances when we hear their story that they, that they would be a good fit for the Learning Recovery Center. Mm. Uh, some people, everyone's an individual, some people really need to uh, have a lot of structure and, and need certain things and uh, sometimes the Learning Recovery Center can provide certain people with, with these uh, alternatives. Um, I know um, we're probably more noted for the medication people, you know, that we believe strongly in medication. Well, when you're dealing with a severe mental illness like schizophrenia, which my son has, um, I would not have him here today if it were for medication. You know, some people really need medication. Other people uh, could probably be helped by a more holistic approach and the Learning Recovery Center. But essentially, NAMI is open to kind of thinking broadly. Yes, we, we, yes, we do, because we realize that everyone is an individual. And, and uh, I know that it's, it's said that um, the drug companies support us. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people think that way, uh, but that definitely is not true. <laughs> we, you know, we don't want that kind of a reputation that the drug companies are supporting us nationally. You know, the national organization. So, uh, yeah. Also, um, if I may, sometimes those programs are great too, and the families want to be involved, but it, sometimes it's cost prohibitive which is another issue. But nonetheless, we never, there's all, it depends on the individual, and we encourage families to explore them and to look into them. Whatever works best for them, right. or just in favor of recovery. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for making the time for us. Thank you, Pam Powers, for your support, for uh, recording all of this, and to NCTV. Thank you to both Thank of you, you for the work that you do and for coming to talk Thank to you. us. Oh, and it should be noted that Bernice has the best shoes that have ever been. I love them. <laughs> <laughs> so She's a snappy guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely wear best shoes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. So what do we have? Five thirty. We're almost to five. Oh, right. Um, we have representatives from Worth Library. Can move up to the front row now that you're center stage. Um, Janet Pye and Lisa Downing, Hi, Lisa and Marjorie. Um, thank you for coming to the Social Services Veterans and Recreation Committee meeting. And we're really sorry that our chair, um, Marianne Labarge, is not able to be here. Um, she had to leave. Um, what else? Is, you're being recorded, so just so that you know, you're being recorded <laughs> by both the North Street Association and NCTV, which will be aired um, on television. Um, is there anything else that we're supposed to say? This is uh, Councillor Shara from Ward 4. I am Councillor Klein from Ward 7. Our Ward. Ward. Yeah, when we booked you, we didn't know when we booked you. We booked you. So I'm sorry. I said when, when this was booked, we didn't realize it was going to be, obviously, such a busy week for you over there. So, no, you didn't leave Thank you for coming, regardless of what's going on. You're very welcome. Well, thank you very much for letting us come. We're always delighted to go anywhere and talk about the library. And we've, you've already met Lisa and Marjorie. Um, so I was just going to say you know, a brief word about the library. Lisa will talk about our, our services and our usage. And then I will talk about finances. And Marjorie will discuss sort of her advocacy role and the needs of those for whom she is. Okay. Um, so Forbes Library is the one Northampton public institution that genuinely serves all of the citizens of Northampton. It offers materials, information, and programs for every age, from infants to elders in nursing homes. 
uh, to every economic group, from the homeless to the very wealthy, and every educational level, from those just learning to read to scholarly researchers. Forbes offers entertainment, education, and community. And it offers all who enter the gratification of knowing that the magnificent building with its glorious interior is theirs as res a resident of Northampton. At Forbes, everyone is welcomed and everyone is valued. So Lisa will talk a little bit about what we do at Forbes. Great, and I do have handouts here. Uh, Lisa Downey, the assistant director at the library, and we really we just love the library, and it's a joy to talk about it. So thank you again for having us here today. I will just talk briefly about how the library is used, and uh, I do hope that you'll look through some of the materials in in the folders. They're they're really fun. Many of them are brochures and things that you'll find around the library. There's also our annual report in there. And I've titled one of the handouts the start of it, Books Are Just the Beginning, because I think books are the, the defining um, feature in many people's minds of a library. And it is true, we have lots of books, and we circulate a lot of books. We circulate a lot of other things as well. Um, 396,000 items last year. So we're very busy. We're just a, we're a busy place. Um, 175 items an, an hour being checked out. So I, I just want to stress that it's a busy environment. Uh, we are thrilled because uh, sometimes when we are at national or regional library conferences, there's a fear about what the future of the library is. But our public library is going strong, and we are adapting to meet both the traditional needs and some of the more modern needs and emerging needs. And so e-books and digital resources is something that we're really stressing. We have a collection of about 30,000 free digital ebooks and audiobooks, as well as staff that can help you learn how to use those items. And uh, sometimes it is the downloading that is the tricky part. So we are happy to provide one on one instruction in those areas. And it's an area that we're committed to continue to grow. We watch very closely the usage statistics. Um, Northampton is a very high tech area, and um, so we want to stay on top of that as best as, we, as, as, as we're able, um, because we're also supporting uh, more traditional formats. Uh, besides books, there's magazines, audio books in several formats, music, magazines, like I said that before, museum passes, musical instruments, so there's, there are many things that you can find at the library. 62% uh, of Northampton residents have library cards, that we're a statistic we're very proud of. Um, and uh, we are part of a network of libraries that includes the Lilly Library in Florence. It's called the CW Mars Network, and um, we b bring items in. So what we don't have in our 200,000 items uh, that you'll find on the shelves, we can borrow from another library, and it's a very popular service. We loaned 38,000 items last year. Um, it's a beautiful place to be. People just love to spend time there. Uh, this this week with the fire, it's really uh, reinforced in our mind just how important it is as a physical space, as a community space. People consider it theirs, and um, and that was uh, we were reminded of that fact um, again this week. Uh, we have free Wi-Fi, conference rooms, computers. Uh, there's an art gallery. There's just a lot of reasons to want to come into the physical space, and we get about 700 visitors a day. So there, there people are coming in. Uh, and uh, we have historical collections, the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Library and Museum. Um, I believe you were in for a tour recently with, yeah. our, uh, with our archivist, so we're always happy to show that off. And we, it is used by researchers, but it's also used by school children and tourists and, and just curious people wanting to know about our 30th president. We also have the uh, Hampshire Room for Local History, which provides historical records of Hampshire County that's uh, used by genealogists, um, researchers, curious people, home people who buy homes that want to find out more about the history of their ho of their homes. Um, we have the Daily Hampshire Gazette, our hometown paper, um, both um, in microfilm, some print, and then digitally. And that's a resource that's used extensively for, by researchers as well as uh, students. Um, the building itself is is on the historic registry, and it has been um, re renovated and continues to be renovated to make it. Um, accessible and um, functional as it can, and those needs do change with, as, as people's use of the space changes. 
Um, we offer programming. That was um, one enhancement a few years ago. Our friends, uh, we renovated a, a space that was being used for um, housing back issues of magazines, and now it is our community room. And that space, along with a couple of others, we we use for library programming as well as let the community in um, to use it for meetings and um, workshops and other types of things. Last year our meeting rooms were used over 700 times, so they're, they're very popular free spaces. We try to keep everything free um, as, as best we can. Um, and 17,000 people attended programs at Forbes last year, and so this is one way that we've really tried to think of a modern approach using the library as a, um, as a place to educate and to entertain. It's a place to, to go and learn something, um, and often the best way to do that is in person. So our workshops are an extension of our mission, and um, we, we had a fun statistic that we believe that the youngest patron to attend a program this past year was six weeks old for our tummy time uh, program, and our oldest known patron, although we don't ask people how old they are, <laughs> was 95 years old. So we, we do really serve everyone uh, of all ages, as well as every other type of characteristic of people. Uh, we have a summer reading program that's ongoing right now for all ages, including adults. We have fabulous prizes. There's an online entry form, so we encourage people, any, any reading qualifies you to, to, to join and to, to be eligible for prizes. Uh, we have a teen advisory board that has recently restarted and is helping us figure out how to get young adults in. Um, they've planned things like writing workshops, recycled craft workshops, and filmmaking classes where we partnered with NCTV um, for that project. We have programs for, for job seekers um, that's uh, garnered us some, some regional recognition for the work that we do through our job seeker support group that meets every Tuesday, as well as a one-on-one -on -one resume and cover letter support service that happens. And that's been, that was something that we developed during the recession, but we have ongoing and people still really enjoy and, and get a lot out of it. Um, literary and historical lectures, we have a writer in residence um, who helps us bring our readers and writers together and uh, six book discussions in the adult department and another three in children. So we're quite busy. Uh, we do partner with many organizations, uh, including NAMI. We actually are hosting this month. It's the um, uh, National uh, Month for uh, People of uh, Minorities with Mental Health I I Issues. I don't know if they mentioned that, but um, the woman in the blue, I can't remember her name, came in and donated some books to us, and we have a display. So we use the space as an extension of the interests and needs of the community, both through displays, meeting spaces, other types of partnerships. We have a an edible garden that's just been started back behind the library by a, a local nonprofit called Help Yourself, and it's a community uh, garden uh, in a sort of shady space that they're growing qu uh, quite a bit of food. So I encourage you to go and, and check that out. Um, we are utilize volunteers. Um, it's just one area that another way that we sort of partner with people and provide opportunities. We had uh, over 5,000. 700 hours of volunteer service last year, and we are now a, a member of the Senior Tax Work-Off Program. Um, we have somebody in shelving, and we have some other jobs that we're lining up for people. And really our staff is, is uh, I, will, I, will, I will stop after this, but um, there's something we're very proud of because they're very highly skilled, and um, they can provide the tradi traditional reference services that we all grew up with, but then they also help people in our community navigate the digital world and there are many people that computers and technology is still a, a real burden for, or don't, they just don't have access to it, as well as e-readers or um, just the best place to get information. And um, that's one way that our world has changed in, in, my, in my tenure as a librarian, and that continues to happen. And last year they answered over 50,000 questions, so it's not, it's not something that has ceased. <coughs> it's amazingly busy with their, their research and reference departments. And an extension of that is our website, ForbesLibrary.org, which I encourage everyone to visit. There's a bookmark with that address on it. If you haven't been there, there's a lot that's available 24 hours a day, and we're quite proud of it, um, including um, book recommendations and our calendar of events that you'll find there. And um, I'll just end by, again, thanking you for having us and saying that we really want to do um, listen and respond to the community's needs. We're always looking for ways that we can um, better serve the community uh, and one thing that we have coming up this upcoming year, which you'll hear more about, is a, the um, elevator. Uh, we're going to replace the lift in our front entry with an elevator, which will really improve handicap accessibility. And then we've, um, we'll be doing some grant funding, which I'll let Jana talk about, that will even expand that, the possibilities there. So we're, we're quite pleased um, to have received that grant. So thank you very much.
Um, and I would just say, if you have any questions at any time, just stop and ask. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how, the, how we do all these amazing things. And, um, first of all, uh, the public libraries in Massachusetts are um, certified by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. And there's quite a long list of requirements that you have to meet to be certified. And um, with with certification, the library receives state aid, and we're we, it's roughly $35,000 a year that Forbes receives in state aid. Um, loss of certification means loss of state aid. Um, with certification, we're eligible for grants. Without it, we're not. And this year, we have, um, uh, in 2012, FY12, we had $22,000 worth of grants. This year, we have an $18,000 disability grant and a $3,000 restoration grant to work on our Civil War archives. Um, and perhaps most important to the people that use the library is without certification, Forbes could not participate in interlibrary loan. And as Lisa said, interlibrary loan is very popular, very important, and it's something that people totally take for granted. They can sit at home at midnight in their pajamas and order a book and know that they can go pick it up. And um, without it, we would be very, very, <laughs> we'd be stormy. Um, so part, there's, as I said, there's many requirements. Um, one of them is that we spend an, an amount equal to 13% of our city appropriation on materials that circulate, uh, books, DVDs, databases, and things like that. And um, another one of them is that the city appropriation has to increase by an average of 1.2% over the previous three years. And that is something that we have gotten cooperation from the city government always in ensuring that happens. And never has that amount been less than what we received back in state aid. And in fact, state aid is usually about twice that amount. So it is not an unfunded mandate in this case. Um, so we're very happy that we can say that Forbes has always been certified. And if Forbes lost certification, so would Lily. The state looks at the community not at an individual library. So it's not like if we lost it, they could go over to Lilly and get in the library loan. And the other thing that would happen is that not only would um, our patrons be blocked from uh, interlibrary loan, but if the patrons went to the East Hampton Library, the Forbes or the Lilly card wouldn't work there. They would be denied services at every other library in Massachusetts too. So as you can see, there's really no question that survey certification is required. So we are very thankful that we can count on a 1.2% increase. However, that is not nearly enough uh, to, to match inflation. So um, we, um, the FY15 budget, the one that we're just entering, um, the library is receiving um, $1,163,512, which is 1.1% 1 .1 of the city's entire budget. And 10 years ago, the library received 1.6% of the city's budget. So you can see that over the years, even though we've increased the amount of money we actually get, our share of the budget has not has declined. And if we were getting 1.6% of the city's budget in FY15, we would be getting $500,000 more than we're getting now. And that, you know, this is a number that's just, you know, like fantasy land. Mm -hmm. But what we would do with that money, which are things that in this last 10 years, the library has been forced to eliminate, we would be open every evening in the week night instead of just two. We'd be open every morning instead of being closed two mornings. We'd be open Saturdays in the summer, and now we're closed in the summer. 
We'd be open on Sundays, which we can't afford to do anymore. We would have a fully staffed outreach program. That's the program that delivers materials to nursing homes and to the homebound. We've had to cut that back year after year after year. We would have reliable handicapped accessibility instead of, at this point, still struggling to try to find a way to fund some sort of way to get people into our building. And whenever our lift is broken, which is way too often, people with accessibility difficulties cannot even enter the building. If we had that extra $500,000, we would have fixed the roof, which is leaking again because it's a slate roof. It, the slates need to be repaired every year. And we have plaster damage in our staff room and plaster damage in our reading room from leaks through the roof. So it's not you know, like we would suddenly run wild. It's that we would do the things that we should be doing in and um, the city, uh, we really do try, you know, to be to find funding sources everywhere, and we're certainly working very closely with the city administration. We are working on consolidating service contracts so that we don't have an elevator contract, and the city has a separate elevator contract, and trash removal and things like that. Um, we are. You know, as Lisa said, we are using many, many volunteers. We aggressively go after grants, which I've mentioned. Our friends group, the Friends of Forbes, are wonderful and active. <laughs> they are now fully supporting programming. They're fully supporting staff development. They give a great deal of money to the book fund. And um, as you know, we were, we've were we been fundraising for the elevator. And, so we, we try, <laughs> it's, it's um, just not sufficient. We submitted a level services budget to the um, city and that did not include, you know, op you know, going back to the kind of services we used to have. It was just what we had in FY14. And um, we, what we received was um, <coughs> a 3% increase, which, um, has left us. The city um, reduced our electricity budget by $7,000 because they have taken over our electricity supply and payment. And and they, even though I budgeted $38,000 in FY14 and we spent $38,000 in FY14, they're saying, and it's increased 12%, an average of 12% every year, they're saying that we should be budgeting $37,000. In FY15, so I'm hoping they're right. Um, but that still left us with a $16,000 shortfall. And our staff, who um, have not had their fully contractual raises in six years, have said once again they would um, take a smaller raise. Some, some years they haven't had any raises, some years they you know, had about a quarter of what they should have. So they are um, taking, again, reduced raises, and we have once again reduced our outreach service so that um, rather than our one person going to nursing homes every other week, he now goes every third week. He can no longer go to any individual's homes. And this, you know, this is just heartbreaking to us. So um, that's sort of how we're dealing with our financial problems. So I guess now Marjorie should yes. talk about <laughs> how it affects people. Yes, how it, how it affects the public. So I'm Marjorie Hess. Um, I live on the Stanek Street in Ward 4. And um, I'm very proud to be a trustee of our wonderful public library. Mm -hmm. I'm in my first year of my second term. Um, thank you, City Council, for inviting us to this meeting. Um, to me, public libraries are one of these bedrock institutions in a democratic society. Uh, we provide information and services for free, as Janet pointed out, anyone who asks for them. We serve everybody, we make no distinctions, we ask no questions. What could be more democratic than that? So if you're denied access to the library for whatever reason, be 
because the only day you can get there it's closed, or because of accessibility issues you can't get into the library because the lift is not working. If this happens to me, you're losing a basic civil right. So I'm here today to address what the budget shortfall means to our users. My own hope or my own fantasy when we thought we were getting a level services budget was that we could finally, after five years, restore summer Saturdays. And obviously many of our users hope that too. We get lots of requests. You probably saw the letter to the editor in the Gazette a while ago keep Forbes Library open on summer Saturdays for people who are unable to get to the library during the week or weekend day is an important option. What's interesting is, um, I didn't know the letter writer, but it's James Winston, and this seems to be the second time his name has come up at this meeting. And then we have a comment card, very succinct, please stay open Saturdays during the summer, and we get a lot of these. It's something that people really want. Um, the question that I keep asking myself is were we being unrealistic or even naive to assume that when the mayor asked us to prepare a level services budget, it meant that we were getting a level services budget. So in the January minutes of the trustees, we say the mayor informed city department heads that this year they will be instructed to produce level services budgets. Um, it is the first time in years the city has not asked for budget cuts. The mayor attributes this to the proposition two and a half override voted on last fall. So I have to admit, I honestly thought that meant we were going to have a level services budget and we can, could do a lot of the things that we hadn't been able to do or just at least keep our services level. Um, and you know, the same, the same sort of text uh, was in the Gazette because of the override level services budget. So, but instead of a level services budget, as Janet pointed out, we got a 3% increase, which meant a $16,000 cut. We sent you, you got a copy of the letter that we sent to the mayor. As you saw from that letter, there's no good place, no easy place to cut. There's really no excess in the library, no waste. So what I'm concerned about are the people affected by this. Take, for example, summer Saturdays. Think of the single parent who works during the week, works during the day, cannot leave children home alone to come to the library in the evening, can only come on weekends with those children. Or think of the people who need outreach. People in nursing homes, people homebound, they need books delivered to them. They are not receiving the service that they have a right to in this city. And the other thing is we're talking about a shortfall of $16,000. As Janet said, we are 1.1% of the city budget. This year the budget, as you know, was over $100 million, and so $16,000 seems so minor. But in the library, it's a very major cut. The other thing I've been thinking about is even if you say the override was really just for the schools, as I've heard a lot of people say, it seems to me you can't talk about education without talking about the library. We provide lifelong learning for the entire community. So really, um, what I'm here today is just to let you know what's going on at the library because you'd never know it if you came in the library. The staff is wonderful. They go about their jobs as they always have, serving the users, providing all those programs that Lisa told you about, doing the interlibrary loan, finding the books, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, and people have come to expect all those services, and they should. This is your library. So the staff is so great, and I am so sorry that we can't pay them what they're worth. Um, we're asking for your help, even if only understanding better how things work at the library, the whole budget process, the decisions we needed to make. The other thing that I want to remind you, not only invite you to the library, I'm sure you come in, come in more, um, but our meetings, are they're open to the public. We operate under the open meeting law. Uh, we'd love to have you come to a trustee meeting. Our minutes are posted on the library website. So it's all there for you to see. And thank you very much for having us. When are the meetings, Um Well, they're usually they're the third. I can't right now say they are every third Thursday of the month. We um, try to hit on the same day, the, you know, the same to say the third Thursday. It's usually the third week, but we've sort of had a switch around lately because for different reasons, people having meetings. Um, we have our meeting set, actually, this week, it's Wednesday. This month, it's Wednesday. Uh, we don't meet in August. That's the only month we don't meet, and we have our meeting set for September, um, and then in September, we'll 
who will post the rest of them. But it's posted on the city website, the same as all the other city department meetings. Um, the agenda is posted. Um, so you're welcome to, to visit and come to one of our meetings. Thank you very much. Questions? Mm -hmm. Hold on one sec. I have a bunch of questions Good. for everyone like that. Um, Councilor shared this too, but I just, while you're talking, if you could explain a little bit more about what the role of a trustee is. Well, the trustees, um, we really oversee the budget of the library, um, the policies. We do not get involved with the running, the daily running of the library. Our role is to really advocate for the library and the community and for our users, as I'm doing today. I guess I shouldn't be so, yeah, I, I shouldn't just expect it, but um, how are you able to keep track of, I mean, you were just able to supply such an amazing amount of user statistics. How do you keep track yeah, of Well, the, um, our, our, our state agency, the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, requires that we uh, submit an, an annual statistical report. It's called the ERIS, and I've, I've been in charge of that. Janice put me in charge of that since I've been at the library. And so it really requires us, so we know, and they don't change it much from year to year, so we, we anticipate that we need to keep track of, you know, how many questions, what our door count is, so we do a lot of, you know, bean counting, I guess, as they say. But it's, it's important, to, and it's interesting, I mean, both for us to see what the trends are in our usage and, and what we need to focus on or, or, or study, uh, but also to really to really prove that we're we're very busy and that it's you know you can always feel think you're busy but the numbers are there to prove to back it up. So okay, well, thank you for everything. Oh, okay. I my family I as the I live in the same ward. Um, I'm very lucky that I can walk to the library and my family and I at least once a week, if not mm -hmm. some weeks more than that. So thank you for all that. I I don't know what we would do on cold, rainy <laughs> days if we didn't have the children's library to go to. Mm -hmm. and, um, I just think it's an amazing, amazing resource for the community and we're so very fortunate to have you all doing the, the really hard work that you do with the limited resources you have. I want to echo that. I just, as you were reading some of the different services, I was thinking, I've done that and yeah. I've been to that <laughs> meeting and I've been in that room yeah. and I, yeah. and my partner was actually one of the first people that worked on the Calvary Coolidge collection as an archivist oh. in the early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. So Amy Stam, her name is. Oh, thank you. Um, so I, I mean, I'm just also incredibly grateful and it is, it's, it's amazing what a service a library is to a community and how many hats it wears and how many roles it plays. And I was kind of curious when you were talking about the, the numbers and how you're keeping uh, track of all of these services. If you've done um, citizen surveys or just kind of oh, yeah. talk yeah. to people about <laughs> what <laughs> they so uh, Yes, right. So we, we, the, the, the MVLC, one of the requirements to, to be certified is that we have a, a, an active a strategic plan, and I think we're unfortunately or fortunately <laughs> um, due to do one again in a year or so. So that at that time, we've done an extensive community survey and um, also ran, run focus groups and interviewed community leaders and I, I know I'm sure I'll be in touch and we will be, every, every, the three of us have all been served on that and it's a, it's a really um, intensive uh, you know, thing for us to do but it really, really helps guide us and I just was looking back at the plan that we did in 2010 or something like that and, and uh, looking at the things that people wanted us to do and the things that we've been able to accomplish and and, um, and it's it really I mean we're, we really try to be responsive and not just say that we're being responsive but you know there's certain things we can't do for various reasons but um, uh, we do take the strategic planning seriously and I, and I would say from all of the surveys we've done the thing people ask for the most and most repeatedly is to be open more hours yeah. they love us they just want us to be open so they can use our service. And I think that framing that you use, Marjorie, talking about it is almost like a, not a human rights a civil rights, a right. civil right. rights right. issue. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think that's a really good framing. I'm um, curious about the numbers. Um, I think you said that there are 700 visitors a day on average. 
How does that compare to other similar size libraries in similar size cities? Do you have a sense? I'm kind of curious if North Hampton yeah. is more. Right, so it, it's, um, they have us in the population group that, that starts where we start and then goes up to almost 50,000. So, um, but it, you know, comparably, we're, we're, we're busy. You know, I think we rank, I think six, there's maybe 50 libraries or something. This, I did not prepare this, but there's like 50 libraries in our, in our population grouping and we're you know, within the top 15, I would say. I think we're at about somewhere between 10 and 15. So we're, we're, uh, we're doing well for a community of, of our size. And I would yeah. say too that they d have us in the wrong group. They have Northampton as 30 to 50,000. We're exactly and 29. Yeah. Yeah. And I've told them repeatedly that we don't have 30,000. So. so we're actually competing against bigger communities. Yeah, so. almost and twice still yeah. Yeah, doing you know, very, say, very well. I would like to add, because I know Jan and Lisa can't say this, before I was a trustee, I was a user of the library, as you are, and I realized what a wonderful library it is. Now that I'm a trustee, I know why. This is a wonderfully run library. I, I just working with Janet and Lisa is just a wonderful experience. It's a great step, and it's such a good place, well-run place. There's a reason for all of, all of the things that you see when you come in as users. You know, it doesn't just happen. I'm uh, curious about the, the energy usage piece of you know, the electricity usage, and I'm wondering if there's been discussion around um, energy savings methods that have been put into a well, lot of the municipal buildings. Have you been considered for solar panels in any, um, in any point? We, we were part of ESCO. Yeah. We were part of ESCO, so some work was done on the heating plant mainly through the ESCO, um, switching from oil to gas. And we had already really done what they called the low flame, low hanging fruit, you know, all of the <laughs> bulb switch outs and, you know, all of the different turn off, you know, things that would Ceiling automatically turn off. And yeah. Insulation, that kind of thing? Well, the building, you can't insulate it. It's a stone building with another stone, it's two stone walls together. There's so there's no place for insulation. There is insulation in the attic. But uh, um, when the building was built to be fireproof, and that's why it's all stone, with um, there's no metal holding the building up. There's no framework. It's just stone sitting on stone. The roof is metal, a metal framework with slates attached directly to the metal, which is part of why the leaks happen. There's no subroof, which could catch on fire. Um, the biggest problem are the windows. We have 138 enormous windows, all of which leak very badly. They're all 120 years old with original glass, original frames. And that's something that we have asked the um, um, Capital Improvements Committee for repeatedly and the Community Preservation Act repeatedly. Um, and we sort of fall in this area where it's not bad enough that either of them considered a priority. Um, so the the problem, the energy problem, really is that the city they decided to sort of give it over to central services, which is not a problem. It, the problem is that now I no longer actually have a handle on what's happening, and they went to new um, providers, and apparently the billing was incorrect. But you know, the, I really haven't gotten. They just told me we're reducing your budget by seven thousand dollars because it was part, and they said in part because we were incorrectly billed last year. So, so I don't know. See, Thank you. you know, I'm I'm happy. You know, we're always happy to work with the city in any way and save money any way we can. So, you know. they tell you what the plan is if it turns out you actually do need those seven thousand dollars. No. I'm assuming only good things from them. <laughs> <laughs> I assume yeah. they won't turn the lights out of the library. We won't let that happen. I don't think so. so. Marjorie, uh, Marjorie um, Marianne also asked me to talk about the elevator a little bit, so which I forgot to do. Um, now, um, so I'll just quickly tell you the our original estimate for the elevator, this, this the handicapped accessible elevator, was $296,000, but at this point that was unfortunately a very old estimate, 
The two bids we received when we out to, went out to bid in June were $457,457 and $595,300. So the trustees, um, after talking to the project architect, decided to make some changes in the bid specifications and go out to bid again in October. The bid changes include making it into a winter project um, and allowing the contractor more time for actual construction, which will be more inconvenient for the library, but we hope more attractive to contractors. Um, they're going to allot the materials preparation differently so that the general contractor will have more control and the actual elevator manufacturer will have less. And um, also changing some of the actual bid document requirements so it will be a little easier to bid. Um, but the basic elevator will not change. So the bids, the, so we hope that in October the bids will be significantly lower, but it's still likely that the project is going to cost 100000 or more, more than the original estimate. The library's fundraising efforts surpassed its $200,000 goal by $25,000, and the city's capital improvement committee contributed $100,000. But that still leaves us about $100,000 underfunded. We have an appointment with the mayor next week to talk about it. I'm hoping the capital improvement committee will um, kick in more money. The library trustees are willing to try to get more money. So that's where we are with that. But we'll be going out to bid again in October. Very distressing. Would, would it be in this? Is, is the elevator set to be in the right in the front entrance where the lift is now? Yeah. And so would would you have to close that entrance while it's being worked on, and people go through the for part of the children's time. library? Or? Yeah, that's part of what we're changing. The original bid was that they had to build some sort of tunnel so right. to people. So we're going to take that out, right. and, and you know it'll be much less convenient. Right. You know, people have to go in and out the children's entrance. There's right. a back entrance for emergencies, so we'll still be within mm -hmm. fire code. You have to have but you couldn't open that up as an entrance. Well, no, we can't do that because it's too awkward. But we will not be handicapped accessible during this time. But that happens every time the lift breaks. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Unfortunately, the possibility of reopening the campaign. The we have. We will wait till after our meeting with the mayor before the trustees decide what we're going to have to do. Jenna, can you also give us a, a brief update on what's happening with the? The recovery from that fire? Yes, yes. Um, that is um, actually, I'm feeling so much better than I felt Tuesday morning, I must say. Uh, the the dam, actual destruction damage was very slight. Um, there was the whole, the carpeted, it's the front staircase up near the top. The carpet was destroyed, and the woodwork um, we're finding was not completely destroyed. The, the um, paneling and the um, the wall of, the, of, the, of the railing, the right? But the um, we've had a woodwork conservator in there, um, and he thinks most of it can be saved, so which is very exciting. He was there today doing tests, and the paneling he thinks is just the varnish, so the paneling will be stripped down and revarnished. The the cost of that, of course, will be expensive for this conservator to work on the banister. But the main cost, the reason it's so expensive, is the soot and the fire extinguisher dust, which coated the entire second floor. And there's this white layer of white powder. So all of the artwork. And the Williamstown Art Conservation Center was there with four people all day Monday. And they cleaned all the artwork. And it's now stored away. Um, and luckily, none of it was damaged. They were to vacuum it and brush it off. And then the insurance company hired <coughs> Service Master, and they've been there with between 15 and 20 people cleaning. They have to. They first vacuumed everything, and now they have to wipe down all of the floors, the walls, the ceiling, the light fixtures, the air conditioner the ducts. Newspaper said individual DVD. Yeah. Every single DVD and every single music CD has to come out of its case, get cleaned, be put back in its case. Every book has to come off the shelf get cleaned. On the whole second floor? whole second floor. Yeah. The orient nine oriental rugs are going out to be cleaned. Uh, it's just unbelievable. But the and service master... The three-week timeline? The, the time yeah, the well, the, the, uh, the first day they were there, which was Thursday, they, the foreman said that 
They would have a crew of 15 to 20 people working 11 hours a day, six days a week for three days, three weeks. So, and they've been doing it. They're, they've been there and they're working like crazy, but it's unbelievable, unbelievable. The computers, you know, the copy machine, the disk cleaner, you know, there's 10 computers up there. They probably all will have to be replaced because the fire extinguisher dust is very corrosive. It's luckily slow acting. That's why the art people were there right. immediately so that it wouldn't damage the art. Yeah, I, had a, sorry, sorry. Um, I had a constituent ask about whether a different kind of fire extinguisher could be used. And well, no, this is like um, the ABC yeah. type, which is broad spectrum. And we have, of course, a broad spectrum of uh, you know, electronics to um, fabrics to paper. And um, we care less about the electronics. You know, you can replace a computer. We care very much about the paper materials, the artifacts, the artwork. And this is the least dangerous to those kind of things. We are very, very thankful that they put it out well, so quickly, of course, and no one was hurt, but also that they used the fire extinguishers. Despite the horrible mess, water would have been much, much worse because water would have actually destroyed everything that was paper, or destroyed all the artwork, the walls, you know, all of the electronics. So, you know, it could have been much worse. I was just going to ask you and Lisa, in your career, this is kind of the worst disaster you've dealt with as librarian. Sure, uh, yeah, yeah. So we, we had a little flood a couple years ago, yeah. which I managed not to be there that day. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah, right. but well, we did have a flood in the basement, which was much smaller so, you know, just we had to replace the carpet. But unfortunately, there were some, um, a box or two of photographs mm -hmm. that were in the basement on their way to be, um, uh, on their way to be cleaned, actually. Um, and they were all destroyed because water, they sat, it flooded overnight. The photographs had been in for hours. So, in a way, that was worse, because what was destroyed can never be replaced. Historic photographs, whereas here, everything will be okay. Yeah. Okay. So, thank, yes, thank you very much. And like Marjorie said, we're always there. Anytime you have any questions, just thank ask you. us. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank, thank you for coming today. Well, thank you for having me.